Now, Plants, you run along and sleep in the woodshed the way you always do, Mama said as she closed the door. Dogs were not allowed in the house any more than pigs or cows. They belonged outdoors. Plants sounded scared of something, didn't he? Emily remarked when Mama sat down again. Now, Emily, said Mama, don't let your imagination run away with you. She said it with a smile because Mama understood what many people did not. It was fun to let one's imagination run away. It made life exciting to let one's imagination go galloping off, just the way a real horse had once made Mama's life pretty exciting for a while. Emily decided it was time to produce the treat she had been saving. Bananas. Grandpa had a whole bunch hanging in the window of his store, and when he heard that June was going to spend the night with Emily, he had given Emily two bananas for a treat. When Emily went out to the kitchen to get them, Plints whined and scratched at the screen door once more. The two girls peeled their bananas and began to eat. Emily ate with little bites, chewing as slowly as she could to make the precious fruit last as long as she could. June bit off big pieces of the banana. It tastes mu so much better in big bites, she explained. But it doesn't last as long, protested Emily. But it tastes better while it does last, said June. Now, Emily, said Mama, can't expect everyone to enjoy eating bananas the same way. Of course she could not, but... Emily wished she and June could do something the same way just once. If Muriel were here, she would understand immediately how a banana should be made to last as long as possible. Even though in Portland, she probably had bananas every day if she wanted them. Plintz persisted in scratching at the screen door. Plintz, stop that, ordered Mama. The dog stopped scratching and began to whimper. Plintz is a fraidy cat, said June. You mean fraidy dog, said Emily, and both girls giggled. When the bananas were eaten, Emily turned to her mother. Say the poem again, the spooky one. Mama closed her book. Just one verse, she said, and began. Once upon a midnight dreary... While outside, a lilac bush began to scratch at the window, as if it too wanted to come inside, and the curtains stirred in a ghostly way. When Mama finished the verse, she said briskly, Now off to bed you go. Just one more verse, begged Emily. Scoot, said Mama. The girls washed her face, their faces and brushed their teeth at the kitchen sink, and tonight, because she had a guest... Emily picked up the flashlight to guide the way upstairs. Usually, she went alone through the long, dark hall and up the long, dark flight of stairs to the dark bedroom and thought of nothing of it. The house was dark because each room had just one electric light hanging by a cord from the middle of the ceiling. The ceilings were high and all the Bartlett's except Mama who after all was not born a Bartlett, were tall people. So the lights were too high for Emily to reach without standing on a chair. Mama could barely reach them by standing on tiptoe. The tall Bartlett's had not wanted lights hanging where they could bump into them in the dark. In the farthest bedroom, the girls bounced into bed and pulled the quilts up under their chins because now a cool breeze was blowing through the house. Emily played the flashlight around the big rooms. Its weak light made the white iron bedstead, the only furniture in the room, look ghostly. Even the windows, which had inside shutters instead of curtains, looked like oblong eyes in the night. Isn't it scary? whispered Emily. And did you notice there was something funny about the way Plintz wanted to come in the house? Probably he just wanted a banana, scoffed June. Don't dogs eat bananas? 
Emily, said Emily, thinking that Muriel would have been a much more satisfactory cousin to be spending the night. Muriel would have enjoyed huddling in the middle of the bed, making up ghost stories. June's imagination would never run away with her. She had an imagination like... like a plow horse. The old house made a snapping noise. I'll bet that was a ghost walking across the room, wringing its hands, whispered Emily, trying to work up a good shiver in spite of June. It's the temperature changing, said June. You know your house always makes noises when it begins to cool off. This was the sort of thing Emily might have expected from matter-of-fact June, who was not entering into the spooky spirit of things. Emily tried again, still whispering because she had heard Mama come upstairs to bed. Did you know this house has 13 rooms? Well, said June, our great-grandfather had a big family. He needed a lot of rooms. Oh, honestly, June, thought Emily crossly, you aren't being any fun at all. June was right, of course, but it would be fun to think for a little while that there was a ghost walking across the roof of a 13-room house, especially when Daddy was still uptown at band practice. It would be pleasantly scarier if the pioneer ancestors had left a ghost or two around the house, perhaps in the cupola. But these ancestors must have been too busy clearing the land and settling the state of Oregon to participate in any ghostly activities, like people in some of the sa sad old songs Mama sometimes sang. As far as Emily knew, there was not a broken-hearted damsel or a disappointed lover killed in a duel in the lot. They did get pretty hungry toward the end of their journey across the plains to Oregon, but nobody languished or wasted away. Apparently they ate a good square meal when they got to Oregon and went right to work cutting trees, pulling stumps, and planting crops. June was right. The house, even if it did have 13 rooms, was not the least bit haunted. Emily tried to think of something ghostly, but all she could think of was the skeleton of a cow down in the pasture, and there was nothing ghostly about that. The cow did not die of a broken heart. It was a cow Daddy had to shoot because it ate some baling wire. It had been one of Daddy's best milkers, and it was a shame that a cow that gave m milk so rich in butterfat had to go eat baling wire. And then Plince howled. It was a long, drawn-out, dismal, unearthly howl that began low in the scale and rose in a high, eerie note. Each girl caught her breath. <gasps> Chew! whispered Emily. Do you know what that means? When a dog howls, it means somebody is going to die. This time, June did not sound so matter-of-fact. He's probably howling at the moon. There isn't any moon, said Emily, realizing for the first time that sometime during that evening, the sky had clouded over. It's a dark and cloudy night. The girls huddled closer together in bed. Somewhere a loose shutter banged as persistently as if someone were trying to get in. Emily remembered a snatch of Mama's spooky poem about someone rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Her heart pounded like the dasher of a churn. Vince's howl rose and fell again in a way that made the girls shiver. The snap of the floor in the bedroom made them both start. They giggled nervously and lay still and tense. Vince's howl died, and the night seemed unnaturally silent, as if it were waiting for something. 
His how couldn't mean somebody's going to die, said June bravely. Nobody in Pitchfork is even sick. And then it came. A flash of lightning that for one instant made the bedroom seem as bright as midday. And the white iron bedstead look like the bed of a ghost. The girls held their breath until the crash and roll of thunder seemed to shake the world. I, I guess Plince was howling because he knew there was going to be a storm, said Emily, relieved to have an explanation for the dog's peculiar behavior. Y yes, agreed June. I was almost scared there for a minute. Once more, lightning brought a flash of midday into the bedroom, and the girls waited for thunder to shatter the night. One, two, three, four, five, counted June, fifteen, sixteen. The thunder cracked. The lightning struck sixteen miles away. If you count between the flash and the time you hear the thunder, you can tell. This was reassuring. Emily huddled against June, counting. Fifteen miles, thirteen miles. The storm was moving slowly. Then the rain began. The first big drops hit the roof like a rattle of pebbles. And then, as the thunder rolled on, the rain began to fall steadily with a drumming sound on the flat tin roof. The familiar sound of rain on the roof was comforting to Emily. She lay in bed, thinking drowsily that she really liked June in spite of her plow horse imagination. She was a sturdy girl and the best rope jumper and jacks player at school. Emily may have fallen asleep afterwards, she was not sure, because it seemed to her that she continued to hear thunder. Some time later, she became aware of a new sound in the night. A clanging, banging sound that seemed very close, almost directly below on the back porch. This time, her imagination was not running away with her. It couldn't be running away with her because she could not imagine what the noise was. Emily sat up in bed. June, what's that noise? She asked aloud to make herself heard above the wind and the rain. June raised herself in bed and listened. Wham! Bang! Crash! This was too strange. A dog's howl, thunder, rain. These were easily explained. But this? Emily jumped out of bed and looked out of the window. Through the lashing branches of the horse chestnut tree, she could see a ghostly white figure moving across the barnyard. She shut her eyes and opened them again. The ghostly figure really was there. She could see it with her own eyes. June, Emily cried, look. June leaned on the sill beside her. This time she had no matter-of-fact explanation. <gasps> She clutched Emily's arm. It's a ghost, and it's coming closer. I'm going to get Mama. Emily snatched up the flashlight and ran across the cold floor to her mother's bedroom. Wait for me, begged June. For once, the cousins felt the same way about something. Mama, called Emily, beaming the flashlight on the bed. It was empty. There was no answer. Only the rain drumming on the roof. Wham! Bang! Crash! Something seemed to be pounding on the back porch. Somewhere in the night, Goliath the bull bellowed, and Emily wondered if the ghost was chasing him. Mama's gone! Maybe the ghost got her, said June with a shiver. Your imagination is running away with you, Emily told her cousin. But where could Mama be? Had the... The thing in the barnyard run off with her? Emily tried to say whoa to her imagination, but she could not. If only this had not been Daddy's band practice night. Maybe she's in the kitchen, 
June sounded shaky. Let's go downstairs. Clutching each other's hands, the girls made their way down the stairs. The thin beam of their flashlight seemed feeble in the darkness of the hall. A strong draft whipped at their nightgowns, telling them that the back door, which Mama had closed earlier in the evening, was now open. Mama! called Emily and knew she was calling to an empty house. The draft was even stronger in the dining room. The girls huddled, shivering. <laughs>